Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhad. In this session, we would look at a series of ratios, which are the activity ratios. This topic is covered in intermediate accounting as well as financial statement analysis covered on the CPA BEC exam. As always, I would like to remind you, if you haven't connected with, with me on LinkedIn, please do so. On YouTube, I have 1,500 plus covering all these courses, lectures covering all these courses. Please like my lectures, share them, put them in the playlist. Let the world know about them. If you're benefiting from my lecture, it means other people might benefit as well. I do have a website. On my website, in addition to the lectures, you find additional resources such as the PowerPoint slides, quizzes, notes, additional exercises, and you will find 2,000 plus CPA questions. Please check out my website. If you are looking, if you're studying for the CPA or CFA exam, studypal.co is an artificial intelligence study body platform that matches you with a candidate. They are available in 85 countries and 2,500 cities. Let's talk about the activity ratios. What are the activity ratios? Basically, they measure how effectively the company uses their assets. So you have assets, you have resources, but how well you are using those resources. Specifically, we're gonna be looking at account receivable. And within account receivable, we're gonna compute the account receivable turnover, day sales and collected, and doubtful account as a percentage of receivable. We're gonna look at the inventory. We're gonna look at inventory turnover, day sales and inventory, conversion period or the operating cycle. And we're gonna look overall at asset turnover just at, from, a, from a macro perspective. So those are the three uh, three measurements. And notice account receivable and inventory, those two are part of the current ratio. So we looked at those in the liquidity ratios. So all the ratios, they go hand in hand. Um, I, you know, if you if you want to look at all the ratios, it will take you forever. I'm breaking down into pieces, but I want you to keep in mind as we are going inventory and account receivable turnover. Think about current ratio because both of these figures goes into the current ratio as well as the asset test ratio. Let's start with account receivable turnover first. How do we compute account receivable turnover? We'll take net sales, and we need to talk about this divided by average net receivable. Average is the beginning plus the ending divided by two or year one plus year two divided by two. It measures the liquidity of receivable or how fast we are turning over our receivable. Okay, so first let's take a look at the numerator. The numerator is we should only have credit sales in the numerator. Now, in the real world, financial statements for companies, they don't disclose how much uh, the cash versus the credit sales. So if you look at a company's annual report, they will not tell you how much cash versus credit sales they have because it's part of their competitive advantage. They don't they don't want to they, they don't want to reveal this information. They are not required to do so. So if cash is a significant portion of the company's sales, then this ratio is not as helpful. Okay. However, if the proportion of cash uh, to total sales is relatively stable, then using this ratio will be a good indicator from year to year. What does that mean? Let's assume cash is 30% of, for every $100 in sales, 30% cash, obviously must be the $70 sale. So the ratio is 30%. So if that ratio is stable, in other words, on average every year of our total sales, 30% cash, 70% receivable, then this ratio makes sense. So the point I'm trying to make, we always have to look at ratios and dissect them to see if they make any sense or not. Uh, the denominator, pretty straightforward. The average, average is taking the beginning plus ending divide, divide by two. So let's take a look at an example. Just kind of look at some numbers. Let's assume net sales, 1.2 million, and the average net receivable happens to be 235,000 and some change, 300. Well, if we do so, let me just go ahead and compute this. And if we take 1.2 million, divided by 235,300, we'll get 5.1, 5.09, I'm just gonna put 5.1. What what does it mean? So I'm gonna give you a picture, what does 5.1 mean? This is what the picture looks like. We turn over our inventory, one, two, May, three July, four September, five November, and a little bit over by December. What does that mean? It means we sell on account, 
collect the receivable five almost five times a year so if whatever we make sales in, Je in january we all we almost collected in march march we collect in may so on and so forth so we collect the inventory almost five times so what does that tell us well for one thing before we proceed the higher this ratio the better off we are it means we are selling more and collecting the money but receivable turnover gives you information about the quality and liquidity of receivable. What is the quality? What does it mean? Quality Quality means refer the likelihood of collect, collecting without any losses. So you want, if you have a good receivable, you should be able to collect most of it without uh, without having any bad debt, as, 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 as less bad debt as possible. Okay. A measure of this likelihood is the proportion of receivable within terms of payment set by the company. So how do I know I'm doing a good job? Well, if I'm giving them 30 days, I'm going to be collecting every 30 days. So what is my what is my standard? Okay. Now, experience always showed that the longer a receivable is outstanding, it's I mean, not collected, the, the lower the likelihood you're going to collect your money. So once a receivable, assuming you're giving your customers 45 days, and now your customers are they pass the 45 days and the longer it takes them to pay the lo the more likelihood you are not going to be paid and the lower the quality is your receivable liquidity refer to the speed and converting account receivable into cash the receivable turnover kind of measure the speed how fast how fast for example if we look at this picture for example if the receivable was ending here it will be faster but it's you know so it, it tells you how good is the quality and how fast. Now, another related um, another related ratio to, to receivable is something called days, sales, and receivable. How do we compute the days, sales, and receivable? One way to do it is to take receivable, which was 235,300, yeah. divided by net sales 1.2 million, multiply this by 365. Another way to compute day sales, day sales and collected, simply put, take the number 365 or 360, depending on how many days you want to count as 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 working days in the year, but 360, 360 or 365, whatever you want to choose, it's not going to make that much of a difference, 365 days, and divided by the, the, the turnover that you computed in step one, which we happens to be 5.1. So if we do this, I, I prefer this. I like this one, the 365 divided by 5.1, and that's going to give us 71. And the answer is 71 days, 71 days. So this, and if we use this formula, it's going to give you 71 days as well. So this day sales and receivable or day sales in collected, sometimes it's called in collected, sometimes it's called in receivable, measure the number of days it takes on average to collect your money. Now, also, you want this num, um, you want this number to be as low as possible. You want to collect your money every 10 days. I mean, I mean, between 71 days and 30 days, you prefer to collect your money every 30 days. Between 30 days and 10 days, you'll prefer to collect your money 30 days. So what you have to do, those ratios don't make any sense. So is 72 good or not good? You have to compare the ratios with your credit terms. What does it mean, your credit terms? How many days you set for your company? If you set for your company 40 days, you want to collect your money 40 days, you're giving the customers 40 days, and on average, you are take, it's taken you 71 days to collect the money, well, that's not good. That's that, 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 that's a that, that, that's a red signal. It could be because of poor collection effort. Your, 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 your employees are not doing a good job. Delay in customer payment. The customer are not paying on time. Customers in financial distress, the industry that you are serving, the customers, your customers, they are located, they are concentrated in an industry where it's not doing good. So those are three possible reasons. The first condition, basically, it's the company will have to fix that if it's a poor collection effort. The other two, it's going to tell you more about the quality and the liquidity of the account receivable. So that's that's very that's very important because you have no control over. If the customer is not paying due to financial distress, that's a problem. It means you select the wrong industry, you select the wrong customer, it's harder to deal with. A third ratio that usually it's useful, these are, these are, it's useful because when you compute account receivable, some use net, which is net of, uh, net of bad debt, and some use the gross. So it, it makes a difference whether you use the net or the gross, but one way to kind of look at that net versus gross is to look at the provisional for doubtful account and divide that by gross receivable for example if you have if you are 
uh, if your provisional is 10 and your growth receivable is 100, well, it means of your receivable, 10% you assume you will not be able to collect. It's going to be provisions for you think it's not going to collect. Therefore, this ratio is good because some people use gross, some companies use the net. Which one is better? Well, you have to keep in mind, if you use the net, okay, it's net of receivable, the resulting computation are affected by the company's degree of conservatism. Simply put, if you're, if you're using the net receivable, what's going to happen is, if you are conservative, you're going to estimate a lot of incollectible. As a result, it's going to influence the number versus another company that's not as con as conservative in their estimate, and therefore the ratios will become not comparable. Okay, so if if this ratio is increasing, let's assume this is ten divided by one hundred, and let's assume it's increasing. Let's assume we went from five. 5 in provision, gross receivable 100. So this is going to give us what? It's going to give us, no, let's assume it's increase and let's make it 20. So we're going to go from 10 to 20. So now this ratio is 20, it increase. Increase in this ratio over time indicate a decline in the collectability of receivable. So this is a good way to see how much are you estimating versus your receivable. If this ratio going up, it means there is a decline in the collectability because your provision is getting longer and longer, a bigger, larger and larger. Now, the opposite is true. If you have a decrease, let's assume you went from 10 to 5, this will make it 5, there's a decrease. It suggests improvement of, of collectability, so you're doing a good job, or or the need to reevaluate the, the adequacy of the uh, doubtful account. Maybe this number is not is not correct. Maybe you want to reevaluate this. So those are indications. Those are indications. Now the next thing we're going to look at is inventory turnover. Inventory turnover again. Inventory is a current asset, just like account receivable. And inventory precede account receivable. So before we have an account receivable, we have an inventory. We have inventory. Therefore, we want to know how fast we are turning our inventory. Uh, just to give you some simple numbers, if we have cost of goods sold of 120,000 and we have the average inventory is 20,000, okay, 120 divided by 20, we can say that the inventory turnover is six times. What does it mean six times? Well, just like the account receivable, one, two, three, four, five, six. It means we sell our inventory. We buy inventory here. We sell everything by this point during the year. Then we buy the inventory again on average. That's one, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five, and that's six. It means we kind of think of it as a store. You filled out the store once and you sold everything. You filled out the store twice, you sold everything. You did that six times. Now, obviously, the faster, the better. You want to turn over your inventory as much as possible as long as you are making a profit. So this measure the speed at which inventory move, move through and out of the company. Okay. Now, why, why is this inventory important? Because you don't want to have, you don't want this to be, you don't want this to be long. You don't want this, you don't want this period to be long. In other words, you don't want the inventory to sit too long for many reasons. There's a storage cost associated with inventory. There's insurance cost. The more inventory you, you more, you more, the more you have to pay insurance. In some places, you have to pay taxes on inventory. Obsolescence, that's important. Basically, your inventory becomes basically obsolete due to changes in technology. Physical deterioration, physically deteriorate. Maybe where you're storing your uh, your inventory, it's not in, uh, it's not a good place, and you're gonna tie up funds that could be used somewhere else. So having too much inventory is not good. That's why we have to know how fast it's turning over, and we want to see we want to see how can we improve this turnover. Also, we have to be careful when we compute those ratios. Which inventory are we? Which inventory method we are using? Because if you have one company using FIFO, one company using LIFO, you might have two different figures. Now, most companies, when they disclose, they tell you what they are using, and sometimes they tell you if we use FIFO versus LIFO, the number will be different. Another related ratio to inventory turnover is day sales and inventory, and it's very similar to day, day sales in collectible or day sales in receivable, basically taken 365 divided by the inventory turnover. In our situation, I chose a number of six. Now I'm going to tell you in, in terms of days, 365 divided by six, on average, it's taken us 61 days on average, taken us 61 days, almost two months, which is if the turnover is six, it means 
six times a year. It means every two months you turn over your inventory. Okay, so it tells us how long it's taken us to sell the average. Okay, assuming a, a, a given rate of sales. Now, this ratio, day sales and inventory and inventory to turnover, sometimes the annual is not good because if the, if the business is seasonal, you don't want to look at the overall average. So you want to compute it at a low for a shorter period of time. Okay, and all ratios, you can do that with all ratios as long as you make the proper adjustment for the numerator and the denominator. Inventory turnover offer a measure of both quality and liquidity of the inventory. Quality is how, um, what is your ability to dispose of the asset? Can you find the buyer? And if they can, how fast can you turn it into cash if you sell it? Okay. Um, inventory turnover. What can we say about the inventory no turnover? When the inventory turnover decrease over time, when you are slowing down or it's less than the industry. Well, it suggests slow moving inventory item. So this is basically, this is the first sign, in my opinion, when the company is going through trouble, their, their inventory will start, this, it's a slowdown. They, they, they are selling less and less of inventory. They're not selling the inventory as fast, okay? It could be due to um, obsolescence. They have old inventory. There's no demand. It's not selling. Um, it could be also, it could be inventory buildup uh, because if you have too much inventory on hand, then um, then your, your your turnover would go down because if you have too much inventory your turnover will slow down because you're not selling selling them as fast and it's a, an anticipation of sales increase but that's going to show the next period contractual commitment for example you made a commitment and you're not selling now you have too much inventory also could be increasing in prices simply put your uh, uh, your cost is going up and as a result you're going to show more inventory a work stoppage could be a reason your inventory is not selling inventory shortage overall or other legitimate reasons those are good reasons when you are auditing a company because during an audit you look at inventory turnover and you see there's any major changes and you want an explanation and you want a reasonable explanation and you're going to verify the explanation so those are some possible explanation that the company might give you for example for example inventory buildup if their inventory is slowing down and you inquire about this they would say oh we just bought you know a large shipment by the end of the year and that's why our inventory is turnover slowed down okay now bear in mind that if you have an effective inventory management system it increase inventory turnover for example if you have just in time system where only you order the inventory when you have a buyer then that's good then your inventory turnover will increase okay Another related computation, actually to both inventory and receivable, is something called conversion period or operating cycle. This measure um, combines the collection period of receivable with the days of the days to sell inventories. This this way will give us an idea about the time interval we convert inventory to cash. So simply put, you compute the day sales and receivable, or I call it day sales and collected. And let's assume for this company, seventy five days. And day sales and inventory, it's taken the company 75 days to 120 days to collect. I'm sorry, 120 days to sell, 75 days to collect. So the conversion cycle is 120. So simply put, this company buys the inventory. The inventory sits in the, on average 120 days. Then they sell it. After they sell it, it takes them 75 days to collect. So 120 plus 75 equal to... 195 we call 195 the conversion period the conversion period in other words, it gives you a complete picture how long it's taken the company to go from cash to cash from the time they buy the inventory until the time they sell it another ratio we're going to look at last ratio is asset turnover it's computed by taking net sales divided by average total asset and this tells us how efficiently assets are used to generate sales and the best way to to illustrate this point is to just use some number, simple numbers. If you have a total sales of a thousand and average total assets of ten thousand, well, that's ten percent or point one. What does it mean, ten percent or point one? It means it means for every dollar in assets, for every dollar in asset, you are generating ten pennies in sales for every dollar in asset you're generating 10 pennies in sale now for some for some industry this this asset is very high for other industry this asset is very low but you cannot compare them if they are in two different industries let me explain for example a place like walmart place like walmart 
their sales will be, for example, I'm not going to look them up, but I'm just going to tell you, for example, their sales could be 300 and their asset could be only 100 because they sell a lot. Therefore, their asset turnover is three. What does that mean? It means for every dollar in asset, they're generating three dollars in sales. Well, they are much, much more efficient than this company because this company is generating only 10 pennies per one dollar in sales. But again, you cannot compare Walmart to, for example, a classic example would be a jewelry store. Walmart sells a lot. A jewelry store, a place that sells jewelry, does not sell as much as Walmart. Well, that's obvious. However, we're going to see later that when it comes to profitability, Walmart has a small profit margin. So Walmart sells a lot, but their profit margin is very small. Versus the jewelry store here, they have a large profit margin. So the jewelry store will make up the difference, even though they're not selling a lot, but whatever they sell, they, ma they make a large margin. So that's that's how we look at it. Okay. Now, when we are compute when we are computing this asset turnover, generally speaking, it's easy to you know the numerator. It's easy to compare because sales is uh, is comparable between companies. But what's going to happen is when you're looking at the denominator, when you're looking at assets, it, it, it's an issue because you're looking at total asset, at total company's asset. And what happened when you're looking at company A versus company B? Company A um, could have old assets reported at cost and because they are reported at cost and their old asset they already has been depreciated therefore they have a low book value so this number will be low when you reduce assets this this increases They're just not not because they are better they are not efficient it's their assets are old versus a company if they have they if their asset if the book value of their asset is higher so this number will be higher so they have they will have more assets on the books as a result this computation is going to give them a lower a lower asset turnover so the point I'm trying to make here is you always have to you always have to look into the numbers um, when you're computing ratios because you have to make many adjustments also market value uh, you know for example this company is buying uh, one company is buying bonds and they're reporting the bonds at amortized cost another company is buying bonds but it's for trading Therefore, they are reporting it at fair value. As a result, they have more value. They have more assets. The other one, they don't show more assets. So it's, it makes a difference how the accounting method that you are using, including you know different inventory methods, versus FIFO versus LIFO. Um, uh, so, so when you're looking at, at, at a ratio like this, which is a grand ratio, you just have to make many... Uh, many adjustments so the more a ratio like think about it this way assets this ratio involve all assets well what we're saying is all of your assets are comparable to all of the assets of the other company that's not true that's the, the way you account for your assets will be much different because we have different accounting method than between company a and company b so once you see a ratio with that has those large numbers you always have to slow down and say okay what adjustments do i need to make to make this ratio uh, more useful for me or more comparable okay and taking total assets or total liabilities and plug it into a ratio yeah that's you just have to kind of slow down and see what adjustments do i need to make if you have questions about this topic please email me um please visit my website for additional lectures if you happen to visit um you can access notes powerpoint sites other uh, other resources please consider subscribing. It's an investment in your career. And if you're studying for your CPA, study hard. It's worth it. Good luck.